let's do what we can to uh, to cover uh, the topic of of scholasticism. Scholasticism uh, means that which belongs to the schools, and it is a, a movement that uh, that spans about 1100 to 1500. It's a tool or a method that attempts to reconcile ancient classical philosophy with medieval Christian theology. All right, where uh, uh, as scholasticism develops, they're trying to uh, they're trying to discuss or engage the connection between faith and reason. Okay, so certainly uh, scholasticism is a uh, uh, is a is a movement is an emphasis is a uh, uh, is an ideal that is important for us today because uh, we live in a society that uh, functions on reason challenges our faith and so uh, in a sense scholasticism is apologetics uh, the, the attempt to engage reason uh, with faith. Scholasticism, uh, however, does so not so much by uh, means of apologetics as it does this dialectical reasoning or asking of questions. Uh, one uh, uh, asking questions, and then that brings up other questions and brings up other questions. Dialectical method, of course, uh, is seen uh, um, in its uh, origin uh, as, as being Socrates' method of, of teaching. All right. Um, the definition of scholasticism, the application of philosophy to theology, to systematize, prove, and defend uh, traditional beliefs. The church was the sole interpreter of God's will. Individual conscience was subservient to the church. And there were equal authorities, the Bible, the fathers, the councils, and the church laws. All right, so these are the four uh, sources of authority for uh, uh, scholasticism. Now, early scholasticism developed with uh, cathedral schools, and you'll remember that uh, it was uh, under uh, Innocent III that uh, the, uh, the Fourth Lateran Council uh, provided that every cathedral, that is, every uh, church where, uh, which uh, uh, was the seat of the bishop, would provide a school. So the cathedral schools essentially replaced monastic schools, and universities emu emerged from these schools. They were either founded by a great teacher, that is, a teacher would emerge and would attract students, or a city-state may decide that they wanted a school, and so they would, they would hire the teachers and attract the students uh, that way. But uh, Universitas was the corporation of per persons possessing a common purpose. And these were the earliest uh, universities. Um, Bologna, uh, Salerno, Montpellier, and then Paris and Oxford were the two universities noted for uh, the study of uh, theology. Okay. Now, some of the issues uh, involved in scholasticism included theories of atonement. All right? uh, during Up till this point, we had the early church um, promoted the ransom theory, and then uh, uh, Anselm promoted the satisfaction theory, and then um, Abelard, Peter Abelard, promoted moral influence. Later on, we'll see uh, John Calvin and the Reformers uh, putting forward uh, penal substitution. Now, uh, Patrick, am I correct that this was the topic of your major paper? Okay, good. So, teach us about uh, the theories of atonement. Uh, well, ransom, well, let's start with the, uh, I'll get up here. Yeah, the ransom, I did four. So the ransom was promoted mainly by origin, and essentially, uh, his argument was that because of the fall of humanity, <coughs> our souls are held, held captive to the devil, um, for which God must 
pay him for our salvation, essentially our rescue, our relief. And he offered Christ, but the devil was tricked because he didn't he didn't realize how powerful um, the cross would be in ransoming us, ransoming our souls from him. So in that way, he lost. But essentially, it was it was God paying a ransom to the devil through the cross for our sin. Um, Two questions, sure. Maybe one question, one comment. But what what um, what is the weakness of uh, of this? of this theory of atonement? Well, uh, it, it really it loses the, the sovereignty, the supremacy of God, because now all of a sudden God doesn't own our soul. He's not in, in control. He's scrambling around now trying to fix a dilemma that, that he sort of lost the handle on. Um, what's interesting, though, about all of these, the second thing I would say is it's not as if origin set out to, to posit a, a heretical view of the atonement. I mean, he was using a text, um, simply Mark 10, 45, and, and um, a couple, I think a couple of texts in, in Corinthians, but, but his understanding of, of the cross and what sin did to humanity was, was around him. But essentially, um, it put, put now God on the defense. Trying to trying to, to fix the messy situation. So this theory actually really elevates the devil higher than than, than sure. it's, it's, really it's got it's, it's the whips of dualism are way too strong mm -hmm. uh, for for what the text of scripture would 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 But then another okay. I don't want to yeah, interrupt. But no, before, no, we, before we leave ransom, sure. Let's let's not leave. It. Okay. I want to I want to <laughs> ask uh, what. Uh, what uh, what story or uh, that's been made into a movie actually has the ransom theory as one of its uh, plot elements? Uh, no idea. I mean, obviously the one that comes to mind is, is the movie entitled The Ransom. <laughs> but uh, but I don't I don't think that it even come, I don't no. I'm not a movie buff like you, Dr. Bullock. Okay. So. Well, yeah, we have a DVD and an analog television. So okay. Have, All right. You know, uh, I'll open that up. What, uh, what what very famous uh, children's story allegory made into a blockbuster movie? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We see uh, enacted essentially the ransom theory because uh, Edmund has has uh, has committed treason. Uh, the, the the witch now uh, owns him and demands uh, his blood. Uh, in payment for his treason, but Aslan offers himself instead, and so he dies in Edmund's place, but then is resurrected, and so because of the deeper magic, uh, then the, the, the witch uh, loses sure. her power. I'm not supposed to look at that's how I actually, I, I, I chose the teaching option, and that's the illustration I used to open it up. But. Uh, Anyway, um, my question was not clear, but, uh, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, so the satisfaction theory uh, <coughs> that that was um, anthem, I believe, mm -hmm. and most scholars would say that he's the first one to really, to really posit a theory for the atonement. Um, I, I don't. That's hard. That's hard to uh, to really to conceive. I just the ransom theory, but the satisfaction theory essentially is. Uh, Anselm is, is trying to figure out, I, I think that the text is uh, Cure de, de Homo, is that how you say it? Cure, yeah, Cure de Homo. Like that. That's probably what you're yeah, Why the God man? <laughs> right, so he's trying to figure out why did God have to become man? What, what's behind the incarnation? And his essential uh, claim is that um, because of sin, God's character must be satisfied in some way. And that was what the cross is satisfaction of, of the, mainly the righteousness of God that's been fractured because of sin. And it really has its roots in uh, the Old Testament um, and before the Day of Atonement. Uh, that, that's, that's where you see that illustrated the best. The moral influence theory is kind of comical in that it's just so, so far from 
from what you would think of as a serious theory of tone. And, and a lot of, it was mostly rejected, but it's by Peter Abelard. And uh, I think Gustav Allen was also, was also one of the components of it. That may not be right. No, Gustav Allen is uh, Christus Victor. Okay, he was the first one. Okay. Moral influence is, is basically, you look at God's love on the cross, um, and that that morally influences it. It, it overpowers you and it influences you to love God and others because of that love. It really has nothing to do with sin. It has nothing to do with satisfying God's character. It's actually um, all about love, and and it's more of a subjective theory that influences your life as opposed to satisfying any kind of any kind of wrath picture. Just to back up a, a moment, satisfaction theory, really you can see in it the feudal system where uh, God being the Lord and being offended by uh, the, the vassal humanity and how is, his, how, is his, how is this offense going to be atoned? Well, only, only uh, the, someone who is perfect can make that atonement that only someone who is human can make that atonement. Therefore, we have the God-man. So you can see feudalism very much in the satisfaction theory. And yes, the moral influence uh, theory uh, was was never. I mean, it was it was rejected uh, when Peter Abelard uh, presented it. Rejected by Bernard of Clairvaux, the great uh, staunch uh, theologian of that day. But it was revived again in America under American liberalism. So you can see this, this idea that it has a very much a, uh, a high view of, of human achievement uh, in it so that, that we can be influenced by the example of Christ. Now I think you, that I did assign you the fourth uh, theory of atonement as well, so tell us about that. Uh, the penal substitution um, theory, which uh, interestingly combines elements from all three of these theories, uh, it takes out what's right and sort of leaves what's not. But it essentially is, it, it's pretty similar to the satisfaction theory in that what's motivating it is the satisfaction in God's character. The difference is the satisfaction theory doesn't emphasize the substitution element um, that Christ died in man's stead to satisfy God's character sort of leaves God's character up here and there's no substitution but, but the penal substitution has sort of this courtroom metaphor working to where God is the judge and, and we must be declared right because of God's sacrifice of his son as our substitute so we not be saved. What's the, uh, where would you place the origin of the penal substitution theory? Well, it's essentially this idea of, of um, it, it's a ransom. Yeah. A but debt who paid? Who was who was the early proponent of penal substitution? I think from what I read, the the, uh, the reformers were, were some of the early Calvin, Luther, which was a big. Right. But since then, it's really picked up in a still reform camp. But but those are the guys that are great. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, thanks for that, uh, Patrick. Uh, but so we, we see that in scholasticism we do have, uh, this is one of the issues that they dealt with, was, uh, was the theories of uh, atonement. <coughs> also, we have emphasis on the, the sacraments. And the idea is that, uh, that those who were in the universities gained their, <coughs> their fame and their prominence because they were able to take uh, traditional Catholic uh, doctrine and uh, support it uh, with, uh, with uh, philosophy and reason. Anselm of Beck, uh, also known as Anselm of Canterbury, Anselm lived in uh, uh, the you know, this 11th, 12th century, is considered by many to be the father of uh, scholasticism because he applied reason to truth. But, but, but he began with... Uh, applied reason to faith, uh, he, but he began with faith. He said, I believe that I might understand. So he began with faith. 
Uh, he's known for his ontological proof for the existence of God. And uh, uh, there it is outlined for you uh, in your in your notes, so I don't have time to go through it. And I hardly know any more than what's there on the on the screen anyway. So, uh, just, uh, but this is uh, this ontological uh, uh, proof is uh, kind of a, a a proof from from being. It's a proof from within uh, a person's mind. Then the other <coughs> thing it's known for is the satisfaction theory of atonement. Uh, why the God man. All right, the next major figure is uh, Peter Abelard, who taught at the University of Paris, um, was a later contemporary of Anselm. Uh, he um, had a love affair with Heloise, who was the niece of the canon of Notre Dame. Uh, he was teaching in Paris under the authority of uh, Heloise's uncle. He fell in love with her and actually they had a secret marriage um, and uh, but when she was uh, discovered to be pregnant by Peter Abelard, uh, the canon sent uh, some thugs uh, to Peter Abelard and he was castrated for his uh, indiscretion. So uh, he then was uh, was left to uh, to wander and he ended up um, in a monastery. But uh, he's he's probably best known for uh, his uh, his treatise Sick at Non Yes and No, and this is a collection of uh, traditions from the early church fathers and church laws and scriptures. They were kind of written in a, a, a uh, kind of a, a parallel format. And by presenting them this way, he was presenting theological questions and then showing that there were conflicting responses. His intention was to show the inadequacy of human authority. He, he did not intend it uh, to undermine the tradition of the church. He wanted to stimulate discussion, but in doing so, he stimulated opposition uh, because it did uh, uh, make it appear as if he was a skeptic challenging the authority of the church by presenting conflicting opinions from different sources of authority. So Bernard of Clairvaux uh, was very much opposed to him, called a, uh, a council who condemned him, and it was at that point that he then uh, went into a monastery and uh, um, Patrick has already talked about the moral influence theory of the atonement. <clears throat> Peter Lombard is another major figure uh, in, uh, in this, uh, this uh, uh, movement of scholasticism. All right, later scholasticism uh, developed uh, during and after the Crusades when Aristotle's writings were reintroduced into the West. Uh, Aristotle had been uh, pretty much lost um, uh, because uh, it was, uh, just wasn't available in the West until uh, the Crusaders uh, found copies and brought them back. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was very much influenced by Aristotle's thought and um, his writings, we've already talked about his writings against uh, the Gentiles, written to explain <coughs> Christianity to Jews and uh, Muslims of Spain, and then his Summa Theologica became the um, uh, the high point of uh, medieval theology. Now, uh, we won't have time for Chase to, uh, to share uh, his research paper, but at least uh, uh, Chase, tell us your topic because you you dealt with Aquinas uh, in in one aspect of his theology. Yeah, I uh, I wanted to see how he worked out God's providence with um, free will and uh, God's sovereignty. Okay, very good. So, like I said, we don't have time for him to expand on that, but uh, that's available. So I just wanted you to be 
be aware of that. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is very influential. And whereas we have, on the one hand, we have uh, Anselm's ontological argument. With, with uh, Thomas Aquinas, we have cosmological proofs for the existence of God. He begins with the world is perceived by our senses and then working his way backwards shows that the world required the existence of God. So he begins with the cosmos, he begins with the universe, he begins with uh, what we can see and know from our physical senses and determines from that that uh, there had to be the uh, unmoved mover, the uncaused causer. God is uh, the ultimate value. All right, let's, uh, let's just uh, uh, wrap up our study of scholasticism with the effects of this movement. It concentrated on the outward form of theology and philosophy, ignoring the inward spirit of Christianity. So it, it, uh, even though it was a, this goal was to uh, uh, understand the, uh, the relationship between faith and reason, its emphasis on reason turned theology outward and ignored the inward spirit of Christianity, led to theological <coughs> hair splitting on relatively meaningless issues. All right, the, uh, the uh, very well-known example is how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. All right, the, uh, this, this is a ridiculous question, but it comes from the question of are angels material or uh, non-corporeal? Uh, if they are, well then, of course, you could have an infinite number uh, dancing on the head of the pen. Anyway, this, as I say, theological hair splitting on meaningless issues. And it became a tool of the papacy because reputations were built on one's uh, abilities to uh, uh, reinforce the dogma of the church, that is, the sacraments, and thereby you would earn prestige and the favor of the church. And it is for this reason that uh, when we have the, uh, the advent of Martin Luther and John Calvin, they're going to be very critical of some of the key figures uh, in, uh, in scholasticism, uh, particularly uh, William Markham, who comes later in the movement. Uh, we didn't really discuss him, but he's there uh, in your notes. Okay? Well, I'm sorry to move so quickly through this lecture, but I, I, I knew we were running out of time, but I, I didn't want to cover it today so that we'll have time next week to uh, wrap up our, uh, our semester's discussion.